the goal to get the uh, location to print properly. In the upper, or across the top, are, um, we'll call them tabs for less, lack of a better term, but all the way to the right is one called location, which now has all the information about this building. But if you're here, you obviously know, ah, I just grabbed it. You may want to just grab it here off the side there. And, uh, this is see here. Oh, oh, see up there. Um, we can drag one in from the other room also. Then I can move some stuff here. Uh, but it appears if you made it this month, then chances are good you're able to find your way here. And so this location is not as important. Uh, Noblelog.com for the website. MA-jobs is the list for people looking for work. So uh, there, I'll just grab a chair from it over there and go ahead and drag it in. Oh, actually, there's one in the corner, too. I think you have two there some of you today. If everybody can shift over one, that would be great. That will make it a little bit easier. Uh, oh, there you go. Well, I'm trying to get in because there have been many doctors. For those looking for work who are not familiar, uh, maybe that's jobs, there's a mailing list of people hiring or are offering jobs. So I recommend people use that um, to help each other out. Uh, afterwards, one of the things I did put on the list this time, as I mentioned, unfortunately, I am uh, a triple bump, so I'm not going to be able to do it. But if people are interested, uh, we no longer are getting a free grub, but there are probably a thousand places. Well, probably 30 places which a mile and a half from here. So there's plenty of options. Um, pretty easy to go down to Plaza America, which is into the last stoplight. There are a bunch of uh, easy walk-up counter type places and enough space to sit down and spread out. So if you want to schedule or set up um, a lunch gathering to continue conversations, that's fine. Uh, we do need to start, I think it's at 1 o'clock here. So we need to be careful about our timing. And basically around 12:30 to start playing out here. So um, at the very least, we need to move to the room next door or the front room, just out of this room. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's some seats up front if you need. There's um, lunch. There's another seat by this table in front. Here, here, here. So the biggest part. Well, no, the problem is the tables were set up, and I decided not to tear the tables down, um, which is what I probably should have done to get more space in here. But I figured with the weather, um, it was maybe to keep people away. That was not the case. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So how are you doing over there, Pete? We are online. You are online. But I don't right. see anyone doing that, so. That's fine. Um, so uh, with that, this is being taped. This broadcast will be free to anybody forever and eternity. The NSA will be. Recording it, looking through it. Um, so, um, say hi. <laughs> for, those who, for those who do not want to be, um, keep quiet and stay way out of the camera's way. Um, I think that is it. On the whiteboard up front, there is Wi Fi here. Uh, it's Nova Labs, and the password is robots, the number four of the letter U. So uh, with that, Jason disappeared, but Jason is our sponsor again after sponsoring us at our last location of Palantir has um, offered, there's Jason, um, has offered the space to us. Um, we we'll talk about uh, membership. We want to give a quick plug about membership. Uh, you should definitely join the group. Awesome. There you go. <laughs> nice and short. And after the meeting, if anybody wants a tour, I'd be happy to show you around and tell you about all of the cool equipment that has been donated that doesn't fit in this building that we have waiting for our next place. Very nice, thanks. So, excellent. Um, with that, uh, Roger has uh, spoken before and said he would like to talk. He does uh, a lot uh, traveling around and helping spread the word about open source and tools and whatnot. And he had 
Um, it's probably, I want to say it's probably pushing two years ago, if I remember correctly, on the list. May 2008. When you start asking about photos on the list. All, all photos on the list? Yeah. No. Yeah. No, I thought you were going to talk about something else. No. I was not going to talk about your pre presentation. Okay. I figured you would talk about that. Um, but I remember there had been something on the list uh, about photos, and when Roger had started doing it, he thought, you know, would people be interested? And I said, I'm sure people would be interested. Um, for those who are not regulars, uh, anybody is welcome to talk about any topic they feel uh, could be of interest. We have yet to have a topic to be turned down uh, in our 20 plus years of existence. Um, all I ask is that somehow it has to do with either open source or computers. Um, preferably it has something to do with both, but not necessarily. Because um, we've done outreach before, as Roger will talk a little bit about. Um, and if you just have ideas for topics and you're not willing to get up and speak, put them on the list and there may be someone else who can stand up and speak. So with that, I have a feeling we're about quarter after, which is like when I'd like to start right on the button. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Roger. Thank you. Very, let me know, <coughs> give me 10 minute warning before you leave, because there's something in this presentation that I want to make sure that you are here for. Okay. And if I have to, I'll skip ahead because it will be worth it to me. Okay. I want to thank you all for coming on this beautiful gray winter day. I've been uh, filling around this presentation for a while, and I've been using GIMP for a while. I said, well, maybe I can share with you all some of the lessons that I have learned. But I decided also to expand it a little bit. In the beginning, I have a little bit of an introduction about what I call photo management, and then we'll get into the GIMP. Um, this presentation is posted at bronor.com slash novelog, and there you will find this presentation as a Libre Impress file, which is 30 megabytes. They don't make them small, and it's because it's got some images in it. Also, uh, in July of 2007, my lovely wife Betty was back in the corner, who I'm trying to turn into a geek by osmosis by being here. <laughs> And she's got her shields up. Okay, so we went to El Salvador as um, helpers with the people, uh, young people who were going down there uh, uh, as a group to experience what it's like and learn uh, about the post-revolution life in El Salvador. But the reason I went was to have an opportunity to present Linux in a different environment, and um, so I made a little presentation about that. That was the May 2008 reference to this. Group and that is also at bruno.com slash novelo. Uh, and I put it, put it up there because um, Pope Dave over here in the corner um, mentioned that, kindly mentioned that a couple presentations, a couple meetings back. Okay, so hopefully you've had uh, a chance to sort of absorb this this first slide, introductory slide, which I call the first order management of photos. And part of it is you know, getting them off your camera and getting it organized, especially if we came back from a trip. I had 1,500 images. What a do for all that crap, OK? Well, if you don't have a lot of them, you can fill around with Nautilus and other things, sort things by date, and you know, categorize them and so on. But I had so many that I tend to go to uh, an application called Gthumb. And all the stuff I'm talking about by today is Linux. And a lot of it is installed by default. Some of it you have to act to get it or yum it or something. Okay? But GThumb is kind of a convenient tool for helping to do the initial look and calling, especially, of images and reading the crap. Okay? Um, but then when I'm doing a bunch of photos to make a photo <laughs> album, I go directly into editing with the GIMP rather than some other application. Because I found that it's easiest for me to do the editing. And then create my album with J album. And in that, you can, in J album, you can do a lot of stuff, which I'll mention in a moment. Um, one other note I had here to myself oh, finally, you know, I do my uploads with File Cell, which I'll mention in a moment. Um, First thing you do is when you get a bunch of slides or pictures, images, whatever you have, you make a copy of the originals. I've been sad sometimes when I do some editing and screw it up and I couldn't go back to the beginning and start over. Um, I'm going to mention J Album and a couple other applications before going on to the GIMP. 
I like the album because it's it's very powerful. It's very feature late. Uh, it's a very powerful uh, program. It's some parts are open source, some are not. Uh, I live with them not all being open source because such a, uh, it's it's such a a feature laden album of the generator. Uh, you can annotate your pictures and have comments appear below the pictures. Uh, G album has numerous different skins, and you'll see in this image, by the way, that skins is does it look blue back there? It looks blue on my screen. That means there's a hyperlink. So if you download this 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 presentation, you can click on the hyperlinks. Uh, J album handles videos. My favorite skins are turtle and chameleon, and I usually use a uh, turtle for my for my albums that you want to whip. A couple other cute little features enter geolocation. That is, there's a little uh, if you, if your camera has a GPS in it, okay, you can take advantage of that in an album created with some of the skins with J album. You click a little icon down at the bottom, and it will zap over to Google, where you so you can see. Uh, where your picture was taken. I noted here that right now they have uh, weak smart, smartphone support, which is not that uncommon for, for, for these sorts of things, but they're working on it. Uh, hosting. They host, their, they, they host albums on their servers, uh, but you pay after a free period of $249 a month. I look below mine albums to uh, a host hosting service that I use for my website. Uh, a couple of those I have here, GAlbum has some, some editing functions built into it, you can crop and so on. However, I prefer to, to stick with the GIMP for my edits. Some other advantages is an active user forum with a lot of answers. And I have had the problem pop up and I'll post a question. And commonly, the developers answer very quickly. There's a lot of human interface there. Um, Server-side support, uh, server-side software is not needed. I tried a bunch of different album managers. One of them was uh, Coppermine. But you have to have, uh, can you make room for a couple more people? There's a spot here. If you can squeeze in, you can squeeze a seat in over here. Uh, Coppermine is some of the other ones. Require specialized software databases and so on to be installed on the server. When you do a J album, uh, album, it's all self-contained. You don't need anything that's special on the server side. Uh, I have a note here that if you decide to use J album, be sure to use Orpheus Java instead of OpenJDK because uh, it'll work better, faster, etc. I mentioned to one of the developers that I was going to mention uh, J album in this presentation, and he volunteered to give us a discount. Now, this is the only application that I use on my computer that I pay for because I think it's so worth it. The reason is you know, it gives a little support to developers, and it gets rid of a few little niggling. Uh, things at the bottom, they're not really big, but you know, they're promoting J album in a way that if you buy a license, those disappear. You also get to activate a couple widgets, which I don't use a lot. Anyway, if you decide to go for this, David Alcombe said, use this Nova Lug with a capital L as the discount code to get 40% off uh, through February 14th. And this is just for us. One other note I had here is that if you buy a pro license, um, you can get into marketing of your slides. There's marketing tools in JHelp. I'm going to skip to slide. Okay. FileZilla. I use this for my uploads. My um, a typical album I have, which has quite a few pictures in it, uh, we'll approach, um, well, my Egypt album has 2,750 files and 1.1 in, in 1 .1 gigabytes. Now, those are not all images. J album generates a lot of HTML pages to display the images and so on. 
But if you're managing that number of files, okay, it's nice to have a tool that works nicely. And files, though, I like because you can do secure connections, SFTP. You can selectively upload only new files. Somebody went on an album and you tweak something. You don't want to reload 2,750 files. It'll only overwrite with newer if you set that option. Uh, you can set it up to um, have parallel uploads, I call them, uh, up to 10 streams going simultaneously. So that really speeds up a lot. When I started implementing 10 streams at a time, uh, and I have a FIOS connection, so pretty fast, uh, the, the large uploads would go much, much faster. So FIOSOLA is my favorite problem. Let's get on to the GIMP now, because that's where the real meat is. Okay? What does GIMP stand for? In the GNU image manipulation program. Pardon me? Oh, okay. No, no, no. Image processing. Okay. Oh, 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 okay, okay. It's standard on many Linux distros. It has ports to Windows, Macs, and reportedly to Android. I haven't looked for that. I, I don't like to do work on an Android. That is not built for it. You know, it stumbles and falls and drives you crazy. But the price. The GIMP is zero dollars. Photoshop, the last time I looked, it was 1,000K, and they're moving to a subscription service. Now, I have to admit that I have drunk the Kool-Aid. I took a course on Photoshop at Montgomery College. I actually took two of them. because so I thought, maybe I'll learn some techniques that will transfer over to the GIMP. I was bitten by the snake. They had a student discount, and I bought it. And if I'm doing a lot of stuff, like with my YouTube pictures and so on, I will do that in Windows in a virtual machine in Linux, of course. Okay. <laughs> so there are some very, very powerful features built into Photoshop that really speed things up, especially for pros, because you can you can you can you can set up certain what's going on here. Well, it looks like how fair the projector went off. Is Jason around? No, it's probably simple out of the bulb or something. No, but so anyway, I'm going right? to finish talking about this introductory slide. Um, I, my conclusion is for every day photo, no picture yet. All right, hold on a second. I'll try something. Go ahead. For every day photo editing, the GIMP is great. The GIMP is very powerful, and I only moved over for some of my stuff to Photoshop, but on a day-to-day -day basis, guess what it is? It's a GIMP. There's no light there's no coming out of the camera. Can you get to the emergency? No, So we're getting a second projector now. And we will um, be back online here in a moment. Let me see if I can skip ahead and just say some words here. <laughs> While we're waiting, what I will talk about what you're going to see, and then we will go through those slides. I'm talking about the power of the gym. And these, the tools I'm going to show you today are the ones that I have learned to use just from my fiddling lap as an amateur at home. But they make my pictures a lot better. Things like cramping, uh, changing color levels, and so on. I've got a picture that you'll see in a moment of St. Basil's Cathedral in the West Red Square in Moscow. Forms the extension Through the sky, over, over the, over the St. Basil's, there are wires and so on. Um, in front, there's a traffic sign, a street pole, and so on. So using the GIMP, I was able to edit out the overhead lines, the light pole, and also improve the color balance so the picture looks more vibrant. So we'll talk about using those techniques in a moment. You know, like cutting and pasting are simple tools along with color levels. Just for fun, I'm going to show you some things that are impossible to do that have been done in photo editors. 
One of them has been on the front page of newspapers in the last couple of three days. We know that the Supreme Leader of North Korea, Kim Jong-un, has been in the news for purging his uncle. Okay? And the picture that really caught my eye is a comparison side by side. On one side is nephew and uncle. On the other side is just nephew. Somebody photoshopped, photo edited, and got rid of the uncle. So he's being erased from history. And you know, you know this is good because, because Uncle Uncle Jang, what did they call it? Um, he was a despicable human scum, worse than a dog. You know, and, and people like that, you have to you have to make sure that you can get rid of them. And Friday the thirteenth was not his lucky day. He'd been totally bummed out. He's gone. So we'll, we'll show a picture of um, Uncle and Nephew at the moment. Another was a prize-winning photo of a high-speed train in western China. And in this image, you see in the foreground, in a moment, a herd of antelope, Tibetan antelope, racing across in front of the, uh, uh, of the view. And the background was a high-speed train, uh, which was sort of, from my point of view, showing old and new, modern and antelope and nature in the, in the foreground. And this was a prize money photograph. It turned out that it had been photo edited, and the antelope had been added. And there were some people who were suspicious about, you know, how could this guy photo uh, get, get antelope in the particular position that, that, that they were in in this photo? And so they started doing pixel by pixel examination of the photo. Somebody found an old photo the guy had taken of antelope racing across the prairie someplace. And the rock in the foreground was the same one that was in the rock, uh, the same rock that was in the foreground with the, uh, with the uh, antelope in the foreground and, and, and the train in the background. I think that's about as far as I can go with describing the pictures we're going to see in a moment. It looks like we've got something. We do have something. I am sure that your color is much better than that. I'm going to guess that this is a cable issue. Um, but that's all we have for, uh, unfortunately, this length of cable. I'm going to look and see if I can find. I have a cable. It's legal on both ends. It might be pretty long. Cable in my bed. Really cable problems <laughs> Well, it's just it's dropping. Uh, so go ahead and. Go on ahead and we, uh, we may order Luke about switching the cable here in a minute. That's oh, behind you. Um, oh, wait, you know what? Oh, no, it's mail on mail. Let me just double check and see if it's on the outside chance. Is that menu you had a fair minute ago generated in the projector? Yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Oh, because. Be close to my audience anyway. Careful about your power Just start to flake up. Oh, but there's one on the floor, Roger. I'll plug in your power supply to the floor. On your right hand side. Don't sweat it. I'll help you out here. Whoa! Does this guy know his stuff or what? You know, is that I'm losing that? color because of one, one pin on a cable. But I have never guessed that. No. Not, not in 10,000 minutes. And I'm going to get from it. No, I'm going to try not to get from it. You've been in front of us so many times, it okay. doesn't matter. All right, you're okay? We're okay. Yeah. Except for the head that's right there. No, it's gone. <laughs> okay, this is what I wanted to point out. You see wires overhead at St. Basil's Cathedral and red square down in the front. There's a straight one more. Right there. <laughs> 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 uh, there no, no let it be said you can't get ahead. <laughs> A number of extra 
because you have is telling. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So look closely now. Oh, this is an easy slope. Look closely now. Okay, in this color, you see all the junk in the picture. But also, I want you to compare now and the next one. Uh, and it's really hard to see with this projection system. And in this one, the colors are going to be more vibrant on a good um, projector, a good website, a good monitor. This one doesn't quite show the, the, the color of vibrance that we got. Okay. Here's uncle before and after. Uh, you see that the uncle is in the red circle. And all they did was just kind of chop out the middle of the picture because you notice up behind here, there's a window disappear. Okay. As you look very closely, you see right along the edge of his jacket a little bit of leftover white from the street. He didn't do a very good job on that. Okay. And here's the antelopes, the prize winning photo. Okay. The guy claimed he dug a hole. And waited for seven days to win. Did you believe that? Now here is one of my best gimp tricks. Okay, this is before. This is a lady in a museum in Uglich, Russia. And Uglich, I think, is appropriate name for this place. <laughs> Afterwards, <laughs> now I want you to go home and try that. Actually, this is a young lady. From the museum in St. Petersburg, uh, which is a much nicer town, and they have more beautiful women there than the expressions. Okay, let's get on to the GIMP now. I said it's a very powerful photo editor, pre installed, readily available. Here's your link www.gimp.org. And I must tell you that I'm, I'm very paranoid. So when I am downloading software, I try to make sure that I am going to the site where the, the good version is. And I don't want to get stuck with you know some malware being loaded, downloaded to my computer. Uh, the other thing I want to mention, I, meant, I did mention earlier about the GIMP, is uh, it, it's nice to have it for Windows. Um, the last job that I had, I can't call it a job because they paid you to play with them, uh, web pages. And once in a while, I have to do some photo editing. Maybe it's just rescaling or prop or whatever. And we didn't have Photoshop licenses, so I downloaded the GIMP for Windows. You're like that, okay? Uh, some of the other advantages of GIMP is the extension of online help available. Uh, I have included a couple of references here, which you can get if you download this uh, particular uh, uh, slide presentation I mentioned before. These are the two references I prefer. Um, if you want to do something kind of wild you haven't done before again, just give it uh, and Google it. And, and, and a lot of times the hints will pop up. Okay, now we're going to talk about some tips. And these relate to before and during GIMP. Keyboard okay. short, shortcuts. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of keyboard shortcuts available in the GIMP. And you can make your own, which I have done, and you'll probably see me just inadvertently hit those a couple times during my presentation. Real quick uh, point, Roger. Yes. So one of our Nobel luggers, Jason Van Gunster, wrote the GIMP Bible, and also uh, Luther for Dummies. So one of our own wrote the GIMP Bible. Wow, that was cool. Yeah. Um, file formats, XCF. XCF is the file format you want to use if you're saving detail and your edits, etc. It is analogous to a PSD file, which is what Photoshop saves its stuff in. If you send an XCF file for if you save with the XCF format, you'll have a lossless format. Uh, you can save intermediate edits and layers, which we'll be able to see layers. And it's better than some other formats, like JPEGs and GIFs. Okay? Uh, if you save and resave and resave, edit and resave, edit and resave, I'm not saying it's right. If you edit a document, uh, and anyway, you save as a JPEG and open it later, since it's a lossy format, some of your information, the data that presents the photo, is gone. Add it again, resave as a JPEG. More is gone. And over a, series, over, over a series of edits, your image will be great. So if you anticipate being in that situation, save as an XCF, and all of that stuff will be saved. 
into detail and you can skip back and so on. That helped you. Um, Just can't like see these rejection at all. This one, it's very, very bright. So, just for fun, I'm going to spend the time on this. Um, I found on the web uh, a guide to the built-in key, uh, keyboard shortcuts, key bindings, and again, so it's included in the slide set. You can always look at this later if you're down the, uh, the the presentation. Continuing with tips, when you're there are different color profiles that you can use when you're doing photo edits. And this is not just peculiar to the beginning. If you're doing things for the web, which is what I do it for, most of us do, use the sRGB color profile. Uh, it has less color depth. It's not a high bit color saving uh, sort of uh, format. However, it is more than sufficient for web. And in fact, if you get too fancy and use some other sorts of color profiles, uh, you can end up having problems. And they're designed more for printers and doing other things for magazines and so on. So if you go for the web, use the SRGZ profile. And I have uh, noted here on the slide, which you can download later, how you change and make sure you, are, you fall into the SRGZ. Uh, Color profile. If you can open an image and it says, you want to convert to this, accept it. Say yes. More thinking ahead. Uh, I had to show off my camera. This camera is so cool. It's only <laughs> okay. But when you're using it, think ahead in terms of framing. A lot of us tend to frame our pictures very tight so all of the image is captured. There's nothing around the edge. You know, it gets dark cropping immediately. I don't like to do that. I like to leave room on the sides. You can throw that stuff away later with cropping, and you'll be glad that you did. And I'll show you a couple of examples of how uh, it's nice to have shot wide later on. Shoot at a high resolution because it preserves detail, facilitate digital zoom. I see a hand waving. I was going to say, Greg, turn on the contrast if you want the, the white to be as bright so you can see it. Well, I what contrast? Contrast on the projector. Is there a setting? Mm -hmm. I was, well, actually, what I was yeah. about to do was to go in the back and turn on the lights in this room because this is so bright yeah. mm -hmm. that uh, we may be able to. I think that shows up. Yeah. That's the video right now. Yeah, we'll see Same idea. Yeah. Um, better. Okay. At least it's not one big white blob anymore. Yeah. But I think this just times out. Okay, I shoot at a high resolution. I pick the highest resolution I get. Okay, some people say, eh, you know, I want to save space on my uh, SD card. SD cards are so cheap, I have never run out of room on an SD card. And so you know, shoot at a high resolution, uh, unless you have a real reason not to, because later on, you will have detail preserved, you can zoom and isolate stuff. Let me see an example of that. Make sure your GPS is locked onto the satellites. I was taking a picture in Boron, California of a borax mine. But it put it 200 miles away, so I forgot to make sure the GPS is locked onto the satellite before I took the shot. Filters. I only used one filter. That's a polarizing filter. This is a real favorite of mine. A polarizing filter is nice because it will help cut down glare and haze. The light you see in the sky, haze is there uh, because the light is polarized by little tiny particles in the air. And if you put a polarizing filter on your lens, it will remove quite a bit of the polarized light. And the sky will get more beautiful, deeper, darker blue. Okay. It will also remove specular reflections. That's what you see off of a shiny surface. But you can see this effect. If you have polarized sunglasses, don't try this now. Try it now. You take them like this, OK? If you have polarized sunglasses, or take a polarizing lens, a filter from the camera, and hold it up and look like that. And you oh my god. <laughs> my, I have bad eyesight. This guy's face does not really work. <laughs> What you'll see is a diminution in, in haze or glare when you rotate. Pilots use 
polarized sunglasses because it improves their vision when they are aligned. When using a polarizing filter on the front of your camera, it actually has a little neural indentations on it. You can rotate it on the front of your lens so it will change the plane of filtering of polarized light. Uh, example albums are at bronor.com slash pics, and I've got a whole bunch of them there. So now let's jump right into doing some examples. And again, I'm going to do some cropping, rotating, color level adjustments, highlighting areas with the line drawing. I'm going to create something called a vignette. This is an aerial view of Abu Simbel. Abu Simbel is in Nubia, which is southern Egypt. It's almost into the Sudan. And when you go there, you can see the difference because the people become darker and darker. They, they look more black, not Negroid, but blacker complexions and so on. So this picture here was taken from the airplane. And actually, you can see how I've highlighted. There's Andrew Sindel. I had to look at this picture when I got home for quite a while before I could even pick out where the the, 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 um, the tombs are at. Andrew Sindel, i got to say something about it. It's so cool. It's a UNESCO site. It was taken apart in pieces like a gigantic 3D puzzle and moved to higher ground because it was going to be submerged when Lake Nasser was created by the building of the Aswan High Dam. So it took millions of dollars and a lot of work to take this thing apart. They built an artificial hill and put it on the hill. So this is the same image, but look what happened by having detail, first of all, say by shooting a high resolution being able to, to digitally zoom in, okay? And we can see a little bit more detail now of, 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 the, uh, of the tombs and the, the things there. Also, this shows uh, some line drawing I did around this to, um, to highlight the area. What else did I do? I straightened it a little bit, I zoomed in, added lines to highlight the tunnels, and also it improved a couple of things. Okay, now it's where we're going to get too many of the slides. Um, so we'll just follow along. Um, excuse me, why did my acronym there? We're going to open up the again now to do some um, demo. You can file, open, or hit Control O, hit Control O, and uh, go. <coughs> so this is the way the picture came out of the camera. Okay, hopefully you can see this well enough. I think if we turn the lights down now, that might help because the white light is blowing out the image. Just, yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I will turn the projector light now. So I'm going to put this on the white background. It, it's a little blurry, but it's reasonable. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is rotate. And when you look at the slide presentation later on, you'll see that the icons for doing these. Uh, for these tools are highlighted in the presentation. It's the same with the arrows on the corners. Okay. Can you move the toolbar a little bit? Thank you. Oh, thank you. Okay, let's do it again. Here is the icon you click for, for rotating. You can also do it through the menu, but I am through the menu at the top, but I tend to use this one here. Okay. So what happened? Well, let's go over here and we click on the photo and we see the rotate thing come up and I'm just going to drag it around a little bit here. There's a lot of lag here for some reason. I don't know what it is. So I'm doing it by hand by clicking on the drop down over here to, to, to decrease 
angle I'm going negative. And I might want to tweak that a little bit more later, but let's just live with it now because we're more interested in how to use the tools to get in perfection. And we click on rotate. See up there? Right here, click on rotate, and then commit. Now look at these corners. Watch what happens. The progress bar is going across the bottom. Okay. You'll see in the background, waffle weave, I call it. Waffle weave. What is that? that, that well, that's my chart. That's null. That is the picture of null. There are no pixels there. Okay? Because we rotated this on the canvas and there's no information there because it's all twisted around. The next thing I want to do is crop. Cropping tool is here. It looks like an exacto knife. Anybody remember exacto knives? Okay. Yeah. There are three or four people who know about exacto knives. You know, you're cutting the <laughs> Never went away. That's you know, a lot of the geeks. Do the geeks use the jack Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Okay, so I clicked on that. And you can see right here, if you look closely with the dark background, the knife image and crosshairs. I'm going to just drag this around a little bit. Well, I'll tell you this. We'll look at something here a minute, guys. I have a feeling I'm taxing my CPU. I know I'm taxing this one. <laughs> no, it's not the projector because it's happening on my screen here, too. I'm going to hit escape. Let's try one more time. So I can cross here. I worked last night. Well, it's not working today. So you can see, though, with these crosshairs, you can. There it is. Okay. So we select that area. Okay. And we hit enter to commit. So now that kind of zooms in a little bit more. Uh, I think I'll zoom in just a little bit more. You see handles here in the corner? You see the handles? Let me make this look bigger. I'm hitting Shift Plus to make it bigger and I'll expand the window. Get the mouse wheel on your mouse. Get the mouse wheel on your mouse? Yeah, I do. That's not. Okay, my exact knife is still active, so let's just drag the processor a little bit more. I think I'm taxing the processor here. So I will skip you can uh, refining the, uh, the selection area for cropping, so I can step one to the next thing. And that is, I want to highlight this area a little bit more for the viewer. But before I do that, I want to do colors and grab it. We're going to talk about histograms later on. So just for now, I'm going to say, OK, let's let's squip this little sucker over. See how the thing wound up? Can you see that in the image up there? <laughs> Not very well. I'll turn it off with preview and see what it is. <coughs> yeah, you can see it. It's going to look better in a, in a real uh, a, a, a different projector. So it warms up the image. And, and to me, it looks nicer <coughs> on a high quality uh, screen. Okay. Now, I want to highlight this area a little bit more. So let's do a little bit quick line drawing. And so we're going to find the pencil. Okay. And if you just kind of drag it around. Wow, that's really well done. You can do it sort of freehand like that. You see what I have like kind of jiggle a little bit? So I'm going to undo that with a control Z. Control Z is one of the coolest shortcuts 
Oh, computer. Control Z, not dumb. There it is. And instead of dragging, I'm going to hold down the shift key and start my line here. Go over here. I'm still holding down the shift key. And see how you get straight line segments between the uh, each click. So I'm left clicking with each one. So that creates a highlighted area to really get the viewers eye to focus in on the items of interest. I move symbol from the air. So if I really going to use this later on, and I did, I would save this as an XCF file uh, so I could keep this information later on. However, uh, I'm going to shortcut close this one. And I don't want to save it. I'm going to control O to open another file. Images are coming out of your camera as JPEGs. Yes. Yeah, very good point. Uh, I didn't talk about that. I'm glad you asked the question. I get JPEGs off the camera. Cameras do some pre processing, JPEGs are lossy. But the modern cameras, I've never seen a picture yet that I was dissatisfied with what came off the camera. But some cameras, Advanced cameras will allow you to save on the raw file, RAW. That's the raw stuff that comes off of the image recycling. And then there are plugins you can use with uh, again to, to, to go with raw. Uh, I'm not going to get into raw because that's beyond the scope of this presentation. You know what beyond the scope of the presentation means? I don't know what the hell I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know if your JPEGs are coming off your camera already with an alpha channel in them? Do you get your mesh weave? I have no idea. Go ahead. Well, you know what? I'm going to open up the file I just used again. Uh, notice you have a re open recent. Let's go back to have this in belt. Because I want to demonstrate GIF is not good for drawing. Um, geometric shapes. And this is the trouble I had to go to to get us to get a highlighting area around the templates. And why is that? Well, the GIMP um, is a bitmap program. If you want to get geometric shapes, you need to go with something like Inkscape, which does vector graphics. And vector graphics are not in the GIMP, so, so far as I am aware. However, you can do some um, little tricks with the GIMP to create geometric shapes. So I'm going to show you one. Let's go back. Let's just, we have this area down here that I want to highlight again. So I'm going to do the elliptical selection tool. Can you all see it up there? Okay. And I'm going to click it without feathering edges. Expand from center. Okay, so there's the area of interest. No, folks. Some of these tools are not working very well here. Sorry about that. It's not the projector. So for what it's worth, one of the things that Roger just mentioned was Inkscape. Um, so if anybody wants to start looking at something and would like to give a talk, Inkscape would probably be a great talk. Um, every once in a while, Philip Shapiro came and spoke to talk about, talk about Inkscape. I don't think he went into really a detailed tutorial. There's some online. Um, so if you're really not sure where to get started, 
feel free to uh, reuse and to uh, reappropriate that information. So, you know, if you're looking at doing vector graphics and the rest, take a look at the GIMP, I'm sorry, um, um, Inkscape, and, you know, maybe put together a 10 or 20 minute talk that you'd like to be able to share. So, again, it's a good way for someone to get up who hasn't done public speaking before to be able to offer something. Okay. So what I've done is the elliptical selection tool wasn't working very well. So I went with a rectangular selection tool, and I've selected a region of interest. Now, I could copy and paste the same song, but I'm not going to do that. What I'm going to do is to go to Edit, Stroke Selection, and we have a line width of six pixels. I'm going to go with the defaults and click on Stroke. Okay. <laughs> no selection was secure. <laughs> Try using the touchpad on the um, chair with the touchpad. Okay. It looks, it looks like it's not clicking properly. You can. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll try. Okay. So we position it with this. Nope. Nah, so, selection tool. You highlight the area. It's not highlighted. You're selecting an area. But instead of taking that selection with the elliptical selection tool or the uh, rectangular one, you have to edit stroke and it draws an outline around that area. So it's a quick way of making a geometric shape, uh, a circle or a square or rectangle. And with the elliptical selection tool, uh, if you uh, I tend to not do feathering of edges for something like this, because I have sharp edges. Um, but I'd like to point out so you can expand from the center uh, with that, and so you can make it kind of grow out. And sometimes if you've done a shift key, things will work rather nicely, and you get a circle to the windows. Well, let's cross our fingers on red eye removal. Okay. This is Terry. This is Betty's cat. This is not my cat. This cat doesn't like me. And you see this cat has a red eye. Now I have to confess, the cat didn't originally have red eye. It had green eye. But for the sake of demonstrating red eye removal, I made it red <laughs> so that I could fix it. And I have a feeling that this is going to be as far as they Because you need to select the area. Uh -huh. so green and red eye. There it goes. OK, so now we go to filters. Enhance, red eye remove, before I click, and this is outlined on the slides, okay? I'm going to do red eye remove, and you see a little preview window coming up here in the, in the middle right here. If I click on OK, Tigger's red eye is gone. Cool. Uh, I think this is a relatively recent addition, filter-wise, to, uh, to the camp. Because uh, in the past, I had to do it by hand and go select an area and then color it black or something. Well, something else you can do through a cube is notice the, the, the left eye has a little highlight on it. You can select that highlight and copy it and paste it over here to add a highlight to dress that picture up a little bit. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to do that because it looks like my selection tool is not working very well at times. Let's go on to screenshots. 
I'm emulating a screenshot. I wanted to get something that illustrated our tours in Egypt. So I went on the web and I found this aerial view, um, a satellite image of Egypt. And you can see the Nile Belt at the top, the Red Sea, and the Nile River sneaking uh, to the center of the image. So it's interesting. It's all desert except where the river is. That's the only view. When we were visiting Egypt, our tour guide said he was like probably 45. He'd never seen the land. It is a dry place. So we've got this image, and I've emulated it here so I didn't have to go to the web and find it today. So I copied this screen shot into, um, into um, um, Impress so I can illustrate. But when you have these images, see this little arrow up here? If you click on that, you can make it wider, and then F11 gives you a full screen. <coughs> uh, so this makes puts more information there, so you can so, so you can make it do more with it. Okay, I'm going to switch now to GIMP and do a little bit more demonstration. So I want to take a screenshot of this. Um, so we'll open up again. I want to make it full screen. It's not responding to my to my F five. So I, I want to do a screenshot. So this is emulating. Um, taking a screenshot by having a screenshot um, reproduced in interest. So to get a screenshot, we go to File, Create, Screenshot. Now while we're here, I'm going to select Screenshot. If I had a scanner attached, I could activate my scanner and capture an image from the scanner. Okay. Now I'm going to go down and select a region to grab. And do a delay of a few seconds. Give myself time to center in on what I want to do and set up the screenshot. So I'm selecting the region to grab, and I'm going to give, give a couple seconds here and say snap. Okay, so I can go over here and have the focus be on my screenshot. Okay, now see this little see the little crosshairs. That is for the region of interest that I'm going to capture. Okay, so let's just uh, not happy. Back into the game. File. Waiting for the crosses. Okay, there we are. Now let's cross fingers. Folks, it's not what I did yet, I'm sorry. Um, you can see that there was a, there was a, um, 
um, crosshairs that appear there. And if you drag it across the image, it'll capture an area and save it into uh, another open image in um, yeah. Okay, let's go now and add text to that satellite image that I captured in the screenshot. Another file for demonstration. Okay, here is the product of my screenshot. I have warmed it up by a, a little by adjusting levels. And I want to add some text. So we use the text tool, which is right here. You see that? Okay. Mm -hmm. And let's suppose we want to highlight the wrong tool. Okay. I'm just at the uh, well, I know that Cairo is right there. So let's type in Paris. Cairo. It's a little Cairo <coughs> one. And so close. And there it is. Well, I don't like that because it's too small. I'm going to control Z to remove it. It's not going away. Yeah. Okay. Too small. So we can increase the size of the um, of the font. Let's go something bigger. Fifty. Close. That's not big enough for you to see it. One more try. Oops, I apologize. I don't know why my writing tools are not working. I sure aren't. Let's say, let's change the color here. The foreground color. Make it real. Font is big, 50. Okay, type in the Well, we got the R. <laughs> <laughs> One of the uh, big features in 2.8 is the interactive text tool. Oh, really? Interactive text tool? Big on that. Click. Are you holding it down or are you doing a single clutch? No, it's drag and drop, drag and hold. It's not happening. Um, so we can go to the next step though. Uh, that one. Uh, Here's one where it all works. Okay. We see we labeled the Red Sea, the Aswan, which is where the dam is, Cairo, Nile Delta, Mediterranean. But one of the things I'm going to demonstrate here also
I'm not ready to reboot my show. This is driving off with the organ. I'm also not able to see my layers and tools back here. Well, apologies. We see here that I have labeled several different items on this map. Okay? And I did these in layers. And each one was on a layer. Red Sea is on a layer. Aswan is a layer. Chiro, etc. Layers, think of layers as transparencies on top of your picture. And my. Excuse me. For some reason, I'm not seeing a little, there's a tool here that allows you to select the layers. And it's not popping up on my menu today. I am very embarrassed. Good, good in Windows. Pardon me? Under uh, the, the top bar, can't you get to the uh, the layers? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe so. Reset and close. I'm not sure if it'll... Aha! Thanks. Yes. OK. So here's the layers tool. Okay, now we can see that I have several layers here that I mentioned earlier. Thank you. Um, and there's a little eye that appears next to them. Most of them I click that on. There comes Luxor. Uh, here comes Infood. There comes um, Big Nasser, Edmund Simbel, etc. So when I was illustrating my, my, uh, my um, slideshow, I would turn off the ones I wasn't interested in and just highlight that, like, okay, we went to, 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 to Asma. To save that to JPEG file. Okay, now we went to Edge. Save that as another JPEG file. And so the set of slides I had for Edfu had this map where you can see where Edfu was for Aswan. Aswan turned that on and so on. So layers can be helpful for, for those sorts of things. Thank you for the tip about the window. Okay, I want to go on now to talking about exposure and color adjustments. And we find this on the menus in the GIMP by um, going to the colors and levels menu. But well, why is it useful? Well, you can adjust the overall lightness and darkness of the photo, compensate for, mix, for some exposure problems, improve color balance. Um, but also the ability which I have used to, to use presets on these things. If you have a bunch of images that have similar uh, appearance but you need, and, and you need to do similar corrections. Um, I understand color levels in the following and, and, and light levels in the following way. You can see on some modern cameras, if you set the right display settings, uh, a histogram which shows how the exposure is uh, in the image you're taking. I took this picture on purpose to illustrate that here we have a, a bright lamp and a dark background below. Okay, <coughs> you see that this the distribution of light in this histogram is not good. You like something to have sort of a bell shape curve. By bell shape, I mean you know, the information is concentrated here in the center, but it also tapers off to the left here 
all the information is in the darker areas of the picture. Most of the information is here. Let's look at the next slide. Here, I focused in on the landscape. You don't see her any information at all. It's all blown out as photographer. There is a little bit of information in the highlights over here. If you look closely, see this big line going up here? There's some information there. But what you can't recover missing information. And so if you wanted to get detail about what's in the life shape, impossible with color levels because it's overexposed. And we see here the dark area is all the information that's concentrated down here. You might wonder how did I get pictures of these um, histograms? They're actually you can actually see them in the gym. Okay. This one is from the central area of that last photo. You see a little bit better exposure profile because there's there's more information in the mid in the mid ranges. Okay. Let's go to another one. I took this now at the back window. I was trying to get the ice and snow the other day. Ice on the tree. This is an underexposed image. The information is concentrated uh, towards the left. There's not much in the highlights. Now, if you wanted to, you can improve this image with colors and levels. For me, it wasn't worth it because in this one and the next one, it, it, it was it wasn't pretty enough. Okay, because it was taken on a hazy day. Wouldn't have been nice if there was some sunlight to add sparkles to the ice on the limb, but there wasn't. So I just kept this picture to show the difference in the histograms between an underexposed image and a more properly exposed image. There it is. Good slow response. Underexposed. Now with color levels, you could adjust this and bring out some of the some of the dark areas. Okay. So I'm saying it will changing color levels will compensate for overexposure. Uh, one of the things you can do to increase the dynamic range of a photo is in modern cameras. Uh, it doesn't have to be a modern camera. You can do something called high dynamic range. If you remember photography days of uh, photographs with uh, film, talked about latitude. How far could you go into the dark and the bright areas and still collect data and have a nice picture? Okay. I think that modern cameras have less latitude. You can compensate it with that for that by doing something called high dynamic, dynamic range photography. And you can do it by hand, by mounting your camera on a tripod, taking underexposed, exposed, overexposed. So bracket the pictures. Okay? And then you can combine those images in software. And there are some high HDR uh, plugins for the camera, which I don't use because my Sony Alpha does it dynamically in the camera. Cool. Uh, I'm guessing that you could do the same sort of thing with a raw image, but I don't know. That's beyond the uh, scope of this discussion. <laughs> when we get to raw, okay, let's see if we can do a little bit of patching here. Um, not very optimistic because the selection tools have not been working for <laughs> okay, this image was taken uh, in St. Petersburg. It's a monument to the maritime prowess of the Russians. It's a funny, odd sort of monument. I guess that's why I took a picture. You got parts of boats sticking out of the coast and so on. But down here, if you look in this area right here, there's some peeling paint. You know, sometimes the Russians aren't that good on maintenance. <laughs> what was the comment? Well, I was just saying sometimes we don't do a good job. Well, you're right. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm not a nice guy. 
<laughs> okay, so I want to patch that paint. And let's zoom in if we can. Okay, now we can see it a little bit better. So what I want to do is take my either one of these elliptical or rectangular selection tools and pray that I can make a selection. Okay? I want to feather the edges. What is feathering? Has anybody ever painted over a bad spot at home and the paint on the wall is two years old? You don't want this spot to brighten up and really catch your eye. So you, you cover the spot with a full layer of paint. When you take your brush, you go out like that. And the paint kind of thins out and disappears. That's feathering. And you can do that here uh, in, in the GIMP by selecting feather edges uh, for the selection tool. And that makes it so that when you select an area, I'm going to pray and say you put the selection tool on um, cross fingers. I'm waiting to see if it's going to happen. Okay, see the happen. Can you see the four-headed arrow that's in the center? Okay. You can move the selection area around if you want to. I'm going to move that a little bit. Now I'm going to copy it. Control C. I'm going to paste. Control V. There it is. It had a dancing ants around it, marching ants around two areas. The outer dancing ants are the outer edge of the feathered area. The inner dancing ants are where it's solid. Now let's pray that I can take this with the double headed air to, to move it over here. Ah, good. It worked. Now, I didn't pick the color from the right spot because you can see that it's a little bit darker there. Okay. Uh, so I would probably, in real life, and this is working out with the selection tool, zoom in some more and select a smaller area as close to that spot as I can. Or maybe take a little bit on the right and cut, paste it, take a little on the left and paste it, and, 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 and commit to that. The other thing you can do with the selection tool is get rid of these, these, uh, these lines. So I'm going to stick with this uh, rectangular selection tool and just do a little bit. Do you ever use the cone stamp? I haven't used the cone stamp. I learned to do this, so it works for me, and that's what I did. Okay, so I'll make this a little bigger if I can get the selection tool to work. Okay, now I'm going to do Control C, Control V again. Copy that selection area, Control V, paste it. Now I've got it pasted in the same spot. It's in the wrong spot. So let's move it. And I'm going to center it on here. Okay. But it's at the wrong angle. So I'll go up here and use the rotate tool. Okay. Go over here. Rotate that selection. The point of this is that when you have an area selected, you can use the other tools on the menu for positioning, rotating, etc. So we rotated it, and now it's in a nice position over the line. Uh, um, hopefully the telephone line disappear. And I have to do that in the three minutes because the sky up here is darker than it is down here. But nicely disappeared. I didn't do a very good job of patching, but hopefully you've got the idea. You could try to do blur on the patch. Blur on the patch? Yeah, because we will take values from around it and combine it together. Okay. Good the white is going to get Gaussian white values on it. Gauss? Yeah. yeah. So your normal distribution? The I'm going to make a bad joke. Okay. Using the tools. How are we going on time? One third. I'm not going to save it. I'm going to keep it. 
<laughs> you don't see that. <laughs> That's what we want. I gotta get the right image here. Free select tool, a cool tool, sometimes called the lasso tool. With this tool, you can select polygons irregular select shapes. You can use it in a freehand mode. You can do it in a polygonal segment mode or point to point. When you're making a selection, you close the selection by doing a final click on the first selection handle. So let's see if we can do a demonstration of that. And pray for me, guys, because this selection tool hasn't been working very well. Make it bigger so you can see what we're doing here. This poor guy volunteered for a bleed hair removal commercial. And I don't think that he came out very good. Okay. So let's help him out some. Let's, let's fix that here. So go to the free select tool and pray. Okay. Now I could go like this. I'm going to click and drag. Get polygons, okay? Um, and I can go all the way around this thing and pick the hair, collect the hair. Let's leave this here. And there, we've got the selection. Okay? So let's now, I'm going to do a control C. Control V. And notice now we have dancing hands. And by the way, in doing this particular one, I didn't feather the edges. I want sharp edges because I don't want to pick up the stuff around the edge. I don't want to pick up the boards or the scalp or whatever. And let's hope. Come on. I'm selecting no tool to try to get that to move. Okay. So now we have a level headed error. Hopefully I can move this up. Oh, good. Let's move it over. Remember I said you can use the different manipulation tools on a selection? So what we're doing here is, is duplicating this. And I've selected the flip tool. Go over here and click and flip. Aha! Okay. Now I'm going to go up here and select the move tool. Where is it? There it is, the forehead there. And position this a little bit better. Okay. It's not a really good job because I didn't do a good job of selecting. But I think he looks better than he did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's my personal opinion. This is a 25% discount. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So let's 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 look at what you can what you can get with this now. Let's see if you can find. Uh, oh, there it is. No, please don't. <laughs> please don't. <laughs> let's make it all bigger. Fully appreciate this. And let's go back to our layers. Come on, layers. Selecting layers. Yes. You get the layers up. Yeah. Ah, 
Ah, okay. So I took the hair from another copy and paste operation and saved it into a layer here. <laughs> Doesn't it look good, guys? And now you know why I want to use it. <laughs> Thanks for the top. You know, uh, I could have made it a little bit better because it kind of came in on the site. But it gives you the idea of what you can do to manipulate photos. I think this is a lot better than rubbing out Uncle Dan, even though he wasn't screwing <laughs> <clears throat> but this also illustrates again the use of layers, okay? So I have two layers here. One of them is the background layer, which is gray. You might wonder where I got the picture from. Uh, it's all over the internet. Yeah, you got it. <laughs> yeah, bring it in. That, that's one of my uh, one of my headshots that I put yeah. out there for something. Yeah, that's from LinkedIn. So this also demonstrates another uh, thing about layers here. The, you see the little eye? You can see the little eye up there. <coughs> when you click on the eye, when this appears, you got nothing. Here, click on the eye, you got the hair, which, by the way, was created as a GIF, a dot GIF file, and saved for later use, and then pulled back in. And the GIF file has a, a transparent background, so we can paste on top of Greg and improve his looks. <laughs> like, it's like, it was hard to do, let me tell you, but, you know, it really is. <laughs> And that's, that's why I want to make sure that you were still around. Um, <laughs> aren't you glad you stayed? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody say they're not glad they stayed? <laughs> <laughs> so that's the free select tool. The free select tool is, is, is really nice. I was able to take a, <clears throat> uh, a picture of the Oscar Mayer Mirror Mobile. <laughs> Okay. Of course, yeah. from from the photo museum, and changed it into an Anthony Weiner advertisement. <laughs> 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 and cut away all the background, you know, of the museum itself. So you just have the Weiner. I think the Weiner Okay, we did free select. <laughs> We did a reusing a selection with the flip and the move tools. Uh, let's look at another one of my favorites. And so I said, I'm, I'm picking favorite things that I have used a lot to come in handy to improve the photos I take. They may not be so great for um, portraiture, although we didn't do a nice job there with Greg. But I do a lot of stuff that's out in scenery and so on. So these tools have been nice for what I do. The perspective tool. You can use this to change uh, a distorted perspective, especially easy to use if you have an image that has obvious right angles that have been sort of distorted because you're not shooting head on. I had a photo of a church in Ypres, Belgium, and I took it from groundwater looking up. And so the, the top of the church kind of faded away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. By using the image perspective tool, I was able to open that up and make it look like it came forward, look like it had been shot from directly in front of the church on so maybe the fifth wall and going across the street. Or okay. So the instructions tell you how to do this, and if our printer hadn't worked properly, you could follow along on paper, but hopefully we'll be okay here. So let's open now an image that we can use the image perspective too long. I'm going to open an image of the Parthenon. That's the one in Tennessee, not the one on the yeah. Is the one in Nashville? Or the one yes, one? yes. Okay. Nashville is called the Athens of the South. And because I've been to the one in Greece since I know. Well, <laughs> 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 they could use some renovations. <laughs> yeah, we could have made all this. This place was this was built for the Tennessee Centennial Expo of 1897, of plaster wood brick. After a few years, it starts to biodegrade, fall apart. So it was deteriorated so much, but it's so popular, they rebuilt it in 1920. Okay, and it still stands. And when I was in Nashville, I had to go take a shot at the Parthenon. I mean, it, 
But but I'm not satisfied with the perspective. So let's do two things. First of all, I'm going to view grid. Because the mesh is too small and obscure stuff. I could go in and change the settings on the grid in the defaults, edit preferences, or something like that. Ah, but let's not do that today. The first thing I'm going to do is to just rotate this a little bit to get it a little more, a little less. <coughs> Sometimes I find it handy to do this so I get a point of reference for rotating. So let's uh, fine tune this a little bit. Okay, I'm satisfied enough with that. <coughs> Good enough for uh, no one. So I rotate a little bit to make it level. You see that it's rotating, you see the progress bar here. Okay, now, this is it. The perspective tool. Is it showing up on the screen? It's not, and then it's off the edge. So we'll try to do it there we go. Perspective. No, it's not there yet. I remember what it is because it's got an arrow on the left and the right for the corner. So let's click on it. Now, as with the other tools, I'm not seeing anything over in the image here except crosshairs and the little small image of the perspective tool, which sort of shows up there, okay? When we click, let's make this bigger if we can just now. Okay. 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 So, if we click on the image, we see the things get activated, and we can drag these corners around. Dragging things isn't working well, guys. So we drag these corners. Can you see where the cursor is up there? You move those around until it brings things into alignment and you have a, a better perspective. Um, why is it not working? But it, it's very handy for things where the perspective gets distorted. And, and when we're done with the transformation, click on Transform to commit. And we see down at the bottom that the perspective transformation is taking place. Next, we'll try doing a transparent image in the middle. The selection tool isn't working very well today. Let's go back to the camera. Let's go and stick with this for a minute. Go to the camp, but I'm going to open up the <coughs> picture from Sitgreaves Pass. This image, this is vignettes of highway signs from the area of Sitgreaves Pass on Historic Route 66. Sitgreaves Pass is kind of fun because it's out in the middle of the desert, in the middle of nowhere. The road is so bad, and I was trying to travel trail on the airstream, okay? So bad that back in the days of the Dust Bowl, when people were moving west, 
They would hire local people to drive their cars over the pants because it was so scary. Now it's a pavement that's got a line down the center. I do admit that I crossed the line a few times okay, on that topic because it's kind of narrow twisting. But I wanted to kind of capture these signs and put them in vignettes to, 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 to convey an idea of, of, of where we were and, and so on. And where did it come from? So the image came from taking a picture of the Route 66 sign. You can see, and this if this is what I used to create the vignette. So how do I create the vignette? Let's go up here and select the elliptical selection tool and cross fingers. I'm going to feather edges. And for a vignette, I want to feather it as much as possible. Uh, I think my, my, I end up with a better vignette with a lot of feathering, so I'm maxing my the vignette. Feathering at 100, and it's not showing up there, so let me see if I can break the proof on it so you can see it again. <coughs> so we select the feathering and maximize the feathering to 100. Let's go down here now and cross our fingers and see if we can select. Now I'm not going to expand from center on this one. To draw from lips and this thing. Not working. Is that? Well, we'll move on to the next step. So you drag over the sun. Okay, until you have a elliptical area selected. You have a feathered edge. And you control C and copy. <laughs> And paste it into an empty image. Now, in this particular case, the background is transparent. How do we create that transparent background? Because I want to take this image and use it for the vignette. Okay. So let's see if we can create a transparent background. We we'll go to File, New, say OK. This should work because it doesn't involve dragging and dropping. I'm going to go to Layer, Transparency, Add Alpha Channel. I'll get rid of all the information in the image. So I'm going to Control A, copy everything. See the dancing ants going around the outside? That whole white area with the dancing ants has been selected. I go to Control A, which in most programs is to select everything. And I'm going to hit the Delete button. All the information in the image is going to add empty image. A null image. That's what the waffle is. Okay. So let's pretend that our selection tool worked before. I'll go over here and do a control A, control C. So I'm copying all of the control A copied it, the stuff. Control uh, control A selected everything. Control C copied it and went back to my empty image. Hit control V. There it is. Let's we'll say that I want that to be on a black background. I think Control Z to get rid of that. Control Z is nice. It's undo. Okay. Let's make a black background. Edit. Well, we have a foreground color. Foreground color is wrong right now because I previously made it red. Look at this here, everybody. Can we see this tool? Yeah. Okay. Foreground and background. Background normally is white. white. That's like the white paper. Foreground is what's white. 
In this case, it's red. I don't like red. I want it to be black. So let's go down here. Oh, black was previously selected. Okay. So what I did was click on the background thing up here. That opened the color palette. We select black and say OK. OK, so we now have black as our foreground color. We go to edit, fill with foreground color. Black. Let's go back and control V. There's the on a black I also created a vignette of the byways sign that was along the highway. Made a bigger black background and pasted these two things side by side and kind of jostled them around a little bit. So that we had these vignettes of the two Highway 66 signs on a black background. And I think it made a very kind of pretty and nice highlighting of where we were out there at Sixty Six. So we created a transparency with the layer creating off the channel. And you can go through these stepwise if you want to in the future, if you need to go back to them from the slides uh, in the presentation. We fill it with black. We use fuzzy select with the elliptical selection tool to <coughs> capture the sign to make a thing yet. I pasted that on top of the black in a different image. OK. You know what? We're almost to the end, and I'm surprised. And I have to thank you guys for tolerating the sloppiness here and not being able to use the selection tool properly. I cannot explain that. Uh, the, the last, near the, near, near the last thing I wanted to, to show you is this is a picture. We had some old family pictures at home. And I wanted to create a web bible. And you can see this. So, some of these actually go back into the 1800s. This is, isn't quite that old. It's probably, what, 50s or 60s. But the color in the picture had degraded, degraded due to age and it kind of pinkified. And I couldn't figure out a way to change the color balance in this so that it would look good. So we had two or three of these. I just changed them to grayscale. I think the grayscale in this looks much better than the original. And the instructions on how to do that are right down here on the left side. You go into the menu at the top image, select mode, correct. Their grayscale and commit, and bam, you, you've got a black and white image. Now, it didn't create, correct for some of the, the, the faults in this picture. It was taken with an old camera. I'm guessing it was a pinhole camera. Pinhole cameras had fixed focus, fixed depth of field, and so it was hard to get everything in focus. So you see some things in this image are a little bit more focused than others. You can't correct for that, it's an old photo. But still, I think it's much nicer than the original pinkified picture. Okay. This is the end. <laughs> this this is um, what was your name, Ben? Matilda. Matilda. <coughs> Matilda. In the uh, White Sands National Monument in mm. front of our Airstream Trawl Trip. Mm. Yeah. Matilda mm. was a um, an animal that this gentleman used to um, minister to youth who were troubled. And somehow the youth liked the camel, and he fancied himself as sort of a, a, a I guess I call it an amateur uh, uh, social worker and so on. But he, he used it as, as, a, as, a, as an animal to help him communicate with youth. But I really love to acknowledge now uh, how this thing happens. Greg for shepherding Nova loves Jason. Jason still here? Yes, in the other room. Oh, he's in the other room. OK, Jason. You know, uh, he's, he, he, I think he helped set this place up and so on. And he did a lot for us over at uh, Palantir. So we had a beautiful setup over there. I want to thank you all for being a good audience. I want to thank my favorite person who sit back in the corner, my blue jacket, and my wife for putting up with me 
you know, while you dance to the computer and play with the gimp, et cetera, et cetera. And thank you all for being a good audience. <laughs> Uh, well, thank you, Roger, for coming and uh, presenting this week, this month, uh, for us. Uh, make sure you get your cable back. Uh, thank Peter. I guess he, uh, at the end, I think he figured out some issues with the camera. I think we're going to work on Ken positioning the rest in the future so that we can uh, stream these things. If that's any way we can be in the middle without locking everyone else from seeing this. Yeah, I mean, I think what we'll do, so this month it was already set up in this configuration and I decided not to tear it apart. Uh, next month I am going to tear it apart uh, because I have learned that these tables just take up way too much space and we're not able to get as many people in here. Um, as I said at the beginning, I didn't think we'd have a huge turnout because of the weather or threat of weather or whatever in the area. We'll get a, a sizable turnout again. Um, so, what we'll do is we'll get we have the camera. What we'll probably do is we we'll put a small table in the center and we'll use it for the projector and the um, <coughs> videographer who's going to be doing the presentation or um, streaming the presentation. And we'll just set people around. Um, as I said, right now we don't have a talk. Uh, the good news is I just downloaded um, Steam OS, and I just got to make sure I have a box with a uh, large enough hard drive to install it. So I don't. I have one. Yes. A box. Computer. You have to put it on. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, oh, a. Yeah, I forgot what this. this I have a hard drive box too, but. No, that's not what I have. Uh, yeah, I, I have one. I just got to make sure that it is a, um, it's an I something and not. I know it has to be 64 bit. I don't know if there was anything besides 64 bit. I know it's. A, I know the one I'm thinking of is a 64 bit. It's a nice small little thing. Uh, I'll just probably swing by uh, Micro Center and buy a terabyte drive for 50 bucks or something. So I'll have enough space because they're so darn cheap these days. Or I'll Amazon and it'll be here two days because. I don't care about our, uh, our uh, environment. Uh, <laughs> I tell you, um, for those who don't, who are not Amazon Prime, who here is not Amazon? Who here shops at Amazon? Who here is not Amazon Prime? So it's free right now. Um, I would definitely sign up. That's why I got hooked last year mm -hmm. or two years ago. And I tell you, it's free for how long? Uh, no, it's actually free until like February something. Like two or three months. Yeah. yeah. So it's a, it's a different one than the usual. The first one is free. And yeah, it's you tell me it's not worth it. So I tell you, it's the best $80 in my mind that you'll spend. It was funny. I, had, I met someone last year, and he ordered books, thousands of dollars of books a year for classes he teaches. And I said, well, are you doing fun? He's like, no, I'm sure there's some catch. I'm like, yeah, there's no catch. Two days or $3.99 per item. Now, the only catch is if you do the next day, it's $3.99 per item, not per shipment. So even if everything's in the same thing and it all fits in one little box, it's per item. So that's the only catch. Um, but the Amazon Prime video streaming makes it worth it to me. And you know, if it works, that would not be that much. Um, the downside is I didn't buy a whole lot from Amazon until I got Prime, and now I buy them at all the time. So it absolutely does. It's at 840. The best thing is my wife, that my wife uses Discover. So we basically have it hooked up to the Discover and the dollars. So everything is quote unquote free. Um, but like I said, the um, the shipment is, you just can't beat it, um, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, the only difference is now um, they are collecting, I think they're collecting, or if not, they're going to be collecting January 1, February 15, something like that, uh, state taxes for January. Yeah, they've already been collecting. Yeah, 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 it was supposed to get turned on this summer. Um, I don't pay attention if it's there or not. I just click buy and buy some shit. Uh, yeah, that was the only time until they opened up the. Um, Distribution center in Virginia. Now Amazon, besides making money on shipping, and Virginia making money on shipping, Amazon has a whole bunch of kickbacks for you know, distribution. So, as usual, the user, the loser in the Commonwealth is the consumer. Um, so the user grown the same. Yeah. <laughs>
Yeah, then Walmart is setting up their anti-drone <laughs> setup. And, and <laughs> so everybody was a loser that nobody was. Well, the government is not to make the money. <laughs> Uh, I just I just had visions when I heard about that. Well, that's what yeah. we <laughs> <Whoa. Whoa. Whoa. laughs> get there, boy. Oh hell, we got another uh, another chick flick. Well, <laughs> throw it out. <laughs> the, um, I have some good relations. <laughs> so, but with that, I got uh, I got to get going. Um, I don't know if anybody plans on lunching or whatnot, so I'll have that conversation happen. The one thing I will mention is, so who here uh, either watched The Wire or is familiar with The Wire at all? The show that was on HBO written by David Simon. Face of Baltimore. No. Uh, Baseball, Baltimore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Well, then, then never mind. Uh, he was actually it was on the, in The Guardian. He gave a presentation in Australia. And I forget what the, the name of the conference was just a beautiful name. The name itself sounded awesome. But he